So this time tomorrow is the novel I'll be reading from, and it's about a single father named Gilbert. Uh, uh, Gilbert's the first character, the first third of the book is devoted to him, uh, the second third of the book is devoted to his girlfriend Joyce, and then the third part of the book is devoted to his daughter Anna. Um, what I'll be reading from tonight, what you need to know is that uh, Gilbert has been dating Joyce for about a year, and Joyce has been told by the woman who does her nails that once you've been with someone for about a year, you know whether or not you want to marry them. And so there's this layer of pressure over the relationship as it is. They're coming up on their first year anniversary. And uh, another layer of pressure in Gilbert's life is the fact that his daughter's getting bullied at school. Um, she's, they, they use the laundromat, they go to the laundromat, and in her world this is sort of a mark of poverty. And she's getting bullied at school over it. Um, they vandalized her locker. She's been chased home. She's been pelted with walnuts. There's a tree with walnuts. Um, and so there's these two competing pressures in his life. Um, but the scene that I'm about to read, uh, just before it, he's, uh, they, were, they had a date on Saturday night that got canceled because she had to work. And so she said, what are you doing tomorrow morning really early, about 5 in the morning, 5.30 in the morning? usually asleep at that hour um, and so they're agreed to meet up at about 5 30 on a Sunday morning and this is where the story will unfold. Can you get a drink? <laughs> By 5 15 on Sunday morning besides showering and shaving Gaeta had washed last, last night's dishes and mopped the kitchen floor. He thought about vacuuming but because Anna was sleeping, he swept the carpet instead, brushing the dust and cobwebs from the corners of the living room into a dustpan. He left a note to Anna on the kitchen table and checked himself in the mirror before leaving. The morning outside looked like the night, the air brisk. Gaeta got in his truck, slipped the key in the ignition, and took the truck out of gear, letting it roll down the driveway before starting it in the street. At Joyce's, the porch light is on was on. Gaeta waited, flipping the radio from the oldie station to the news. He listened to the sports scores and the traffic, keeping the volume low. He listened to a report about floods in Georgia, and it occurred to him that he might not know Georgia from Alabama or Arkansas if he looked at a map. For the two minutes before Joyce came out, he felt what he occasionally experienced behind the wheel of his forklift, looking at the serial numbers on the dairy trailers that he'd memorized after seeing them thousands of times. It was the feeling that, thus far, he lived a rather small life, and this sense left him wondering why Joyce was with him in the first place. Gaeta wasn't the young man he once was. His hair was beginning to thin, and his waist had taken on a few extra inches. He was convinced Joyce could be with someone better, someone, with more, attra someone more attractive, and with more going on than Saturday overtime. Whenever he questioned the nature of their relationship, Joyce was quick to point out her own faults, to remind Gaeta that he wasn't dating a supermodel, and to remind him of other things. You're kind, and you're honest, and you're a good guy. I could tell that when I met you. Why wouldn't I want you in my life? She emerged soon enough, and they kissed hello as he opened her door, though the kiss was a quick and awkward peck. They pulled away from her house, and at the first stop sign, out of her father's sight, she leaned over and kissed Gaeta hard on the mouth. He could taste that she'd had a cup of coffee. Hey there, early bird, she said. It took 20 minutes to get downtown, and the tall buildings there made the streets appear darker than those in Almani. Gaeta drove past warehouses and storefronts shuttered with protective iron screens, and in every other doorway, homeless people slept under grubby blankets. The street where she told them to park stank of urine. Around the corner, they found florists doing good business. The sidewalk was crowded with vendors, with buckets of carnations and daisies and roses, thick bunches of orange and yellow, of red and pink and white. There were still more flowers, displays of them already assembled into bouquets, waxy cardboard boxes stuffed with packaged flowers, trash cans stuffed with leaves and stems and other green trimmings. Gaeta noticed a glass refrigerator holding larger, probably pricier arrangements in tall crystal vases. After bumping into someone, he was careful maneuvering through the crowd 
everyone carrying bunches of flowers and oversized newspaper cones, everyone hurried and busy and asking how much. Besides a mandatory bouquet purchased for Valentine's Day from a sad-eyed girl on a peck road traffic island, Galleta had yet to buy flowers for Joyce. She always hinted around when someone received them at work. Oh, you should have seen the roses Maria's boyfriend sent her for her birthday. But Candy's florist was pricey enough that Galleta had reserved flowers for a momentous occasion. Now, surrounded by all sorts of them, he knew that he'd been wrong. He started toward a row of bouquets with red roses and flowers shaped like big white stars, but Joyce pulled him away. No, she said, this isn't it. They crossed the street, and in the doorway to a warehouse, she paid two dollars for their entrance fees. She stuck a pink sticker to her collar, then another to his, and they walked inside. The place was packed with more people than outside, it was filled with stalls of flowers that stretched as far as Gaeta could see. He was content following Joyce through the crowds at each stall. She would examine different flowers, asking for their prices in Spanish, and he would appreciate how their individual scents vary from one another. He'd known how roses smelled because of the perfume his grandmother had worn, and he also knew the smell of jasmine because one had bloomed each night in the courtyard below his old apartment. But beyond these two, he didn't know much. She showed him a bunch of sunny yellow flowers that smelled fruity and bright, another bunch with round bluish petals that reminded him of early morning light, this scent heavy with musk. They did a lap through the cold warehouse and then crossed the street to another one, the air warmer outside than inside. Things were greener in the second warehouse, the vendors selling potted plants and cacti and ferns. Cayeta was taken by some stalks of red chili peppers, but the place as a whole seemed uninteresting to Joyce, and so they turned back in the direction they had come. What's Anna's favorite flower, she asked as they crossed the street. I don't think she has a favorite, he said. Maybe roses? Well then, what's her favorite color? Gaeta thought about their last trip to Ceylon, how Anna hadn't wanted a black binder or a blue one or a green one. She had specifically wanted something purple. He mentioned this to Joyce, and once they re-entered the first warehouse, she devoted her attention to the different purple flowers they came upon. Eventually, they stopped at a stall filled with roses with more shapes and sizes than he had ever imagined. Toward the back, near the cash register, was a bucket of purple long stem roses that Joyce went for first. They came two dozen to a bunch and were yet to bloom, the buds wrapped tightly in clear plastic. Joyce picked through the bucket and soon gave Galleta a bunch to hold, which was tricky since the stems hadn't been stripped of their leaves and thorns. He had never seen roses his deep shade of purple, darker where the petals met the stem like a glass of wine held to light. She went, next, she, next, she went next to some baby roses. These purple ones were soft purple, the edges appearing almost silver. What do you think, Joyce asked. Gaeta moved closer and saw that the petals had just started to open, the buds ready to unfurl. They were reminiscent of the lace accents on Joyce's bras, the fancy ones she sometimes wore on special nights. Which do you like better, he asked. I don't know, Joyce said, let's see. She held the two bunches together, the dark against the light, the large against the small, apparently liking the fit, liking it so much that she reached back into the bucket and took a second bunch of the baby roses to fill out her improvised bouquet. She turned to the vendor, a thin man wearing a puffy yellow vest, and asked him for a price. Twenty-five, he said, fifteen for the long ones, ten for both the short ones. Gaeta didn't know much about flowers, but he knew a good deal when it happened. He happened upon it. He reached for his wallet, but Joyce refused to let him pay. They were for Anna, she said, to cheer her up with everything that was going on. The seller took her money and rolled the flowers in oversized newspaper combs that he secured with lengths of twine. Joyce handed Gaeta the long stem roses and folded her change into her pocketbook. Isn't this place amazing, she whispered. Gaeta nodded. It was amazing. The activity in the cold reminded him of the dairy, though the flower mark seemed beautiful and imported in ways the dairy could never be. The flowers around him would soon be spread throughout the city. They would be at the center of someone's table, or awarded with trophies, or would accompany shiny prizes honoring first place. He saw them pinned to collars or worn around wrists. He saw them tossed blindly over one shoulder. 
We've only bought for Anna, he said. What about you? Don't worry, there'll be plenty for us both. They continued on until Joyce spotted some purple lilies, and it was here that Gaeta found himself drawn to a nearby bunch of maroon flowers situated at the opposite end of the stall. Most of these bunches were wrapped individually with white gauze, but the ones on display were a bright, deep red. They had a charming fragrance, and their petals were broad and round and layered in a dense, protective manner. Their centers were clusters of thin shag. The rich color appeared to radiate from these cores, and the collective effect of the six or seven arranged before him was moving, for it seemed that his concern for Anna these past few weeks had collected in these stems and burst forth in bloom. The sign in the bucket read, Fire Bell Peony, and priced them at $20 a bunch. He was calculating the expense, reworking it into dairy hours, when Joyce gave him a peck on the cheek. Those are great, she said. We could definitely do something with them. They paid for their purchases, Gaeta learning that his peonies were the first of the season, and their arms were full as they made their way toward the exit. The sun was out by this time, though it was too early to tell what kind of day it would be. They returned the galletas, but they surprised Anna with armfuls of flowers. Joyce and Anna spent the morning making bouquets, snipping and peeling and stripping off thorns, filling the two glass vases in the house, along with three old slurpy cups and a beer pitcher Anna had taken from a quinceanera at the VFW. The kitchen smelled sweet and bright with what they brought home, and in the middle of this, Gaeta caught Joyce watching him. She cast him a flirty look. He could have driven past the flower mart a hundred times without ever having seen the inside. And if he'd found the place, he wouldn't have thought to buy his daughter flowers. There would always be things like this with Joyce. New and wondrous things. This is why I will marry you, he thought. The words were there inside him, waiting to be spoken. If he could say them now, he knew he could say them later. Joyce continued trimming and cutting, Anna arranging each flower just so. Since no one had eaten breakfast, Gaeta did what he could, making scrambled eggs and ham and big buttery slices of sourdough toast. Thank you.